Welcome to In the News for January 28th, 2022. A lot of 20s in there. Good morning, Jeff. I am Brett Bernie from AppsonLaw.com. Uh, this is Jeff Richardson from iPhone JD. Good morning, Brett. It has been a, a little bit of a of, of a week in the in the news. Uh, you, yeah, uh, you had quite a, quite a number of bullet points that you listed here, Jeff, and they're all good. But let's start off quickly with I I typically start calling this like public service announcements, but this this update for the iPhone and the iPad was important enough that you even had a separate post on iPhone JD to make sure that people knew this was an important one to do. This was iOS fifteen point three. Yeah, not just me. I think Apple thought so too. You know, uh, uh, who knows yes. how Apple works? But if I had to guess, I bet you that Apple had planned for all of these security updates to be part of the next update with a bunch of features. Right. Um, but then they decided, wait a minute, these security things are too important, and they released just them. And as I predicted, and as I, uh, you know, thought put on my website of there's like 10 security updates, but I think it's the last one that they were most worried about this privacy issue where if you were using the Safari browser, which of course you have to use on the iPhone, right, you don't have right. to use it on the Mac. Um, you, you know, what's, a malicious website in one of your tabs could see what was going on in the other tab. And I didn't even mention this yesterday, but I've since seen Apple say that this was actually being exploited in the wild. It was, they, they knew yes. it was being done. Now, what I don't right. know is the developer himself said, he actually set up a test page where he's like, if you want to just see that this is an action, if you go to this, you know, go, go to my, open up this page and then open up a separate tab and then come back to this page. And I can tell you on this page, what's open in your other tab. And you're like, uh, oh, wow, that's, okay. you know, seeing an action. Scary. So I yeah. don't know if that is the instance that Apple's talking about, or if they know that there were actual bad guys that were trying to exploit this to get your personal information. But anytime that there is something being exploited in the real world, you got to get that security update out there quickly. So we just talked about, didn't we have a 15.1.2 last week? <laughs> like, That's a thing. Yeah. Uh, it seems like that that uh, they may be coming a little bit more fast and furious. But again, this is important enough. Uh, to be honest with you and everyone listening, I don't even understand all of the ins and outs, like Jeff just explaining there, some of the things. But I know when there is this much emphasis across the, the web and the experts out there saying this is an important update, this is uh, all you really need to know is you should go and update to 15.3 uh, uh, on Absolutely. this. Absolutely. And can I say, you even linked to Apple has a webpage on this where they list them. And am I correct on this, that Apple actually even attributes to the individuals, like who actually found these exploits? Yeah. They've like, been doing that for years from now. Apple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they've That's been doing that great. for years. They didn't used to do it originally, but you know, right. they I remember that. They want to encourage the people that find the flaw um, and, you know, I don't know if these people have gotten paid for it because, you know, Apple will also pay for security flaws in some right, instances. Right. And in fact, I don't remember, I don't think I linked to it, but I saw a story just in the last week or two that there was somebody yes. who had gotten paid $80,000 for finding a flaw. And then a year or two later, he found another one and got paid $100,000 and thought that it may have been the most that Apple had actually paid for a security flaw. So he's gotten wow. a substantial amount of money from finding bad things. Um, but even if these people aren't paid, at least they get attribution. And it's great for them because yes. some of these folks are like security experts. And if, exactly. if you're trying to be hired as a security expert and you can say, Apple itself uh -huh. has given me uh -huh. credit on all these occasions. Then the other person that's thinking about hiring you is like, oh, okay, this, this guy's the real deal. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> you got to be good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. That's great. Well, but I also I, think I it's think... interesting that on this page, that, but, you know, especially like if you scroll down to the last one that we've been talking about, their right. description of, you know, WebKit storage as a flaw, it is so underplayed at, you know, a website. You oh, know, my. They, yes. it's, it's like you read that and if you just read it quickly, you're like, oh, okay, that doesn't seem like a big deal. And then yeah. you actually understand what it really means. It's like, oh, okay, that could be a big deal. So that's, <laughs> that's a funny. big deal. That's a big deal. Oh, well, thank you for linking to this. And everyone listening or watching, the most current update is 15.3. Depending on how you've got your settings in the iPhone and the iPad, it may automatically update for you overnight if you've got it plugged in and it's locked. Uh, but you could also go and push that update or just say, go ahead and update it. And typically I find, especially on modern iPhones and modern iPads today, it, it's just a, a matter of maybe a minute or two, I think, Jeff, right? I mean, it'll go through it a download. It'll reboot your iPhone or iPad and it'll come right back up and you can and you can get going. So it's not going to take you down. It doesn't that take long. long. Yeah, this, maybe 10 minutes or something. Yeah, yeah this but... is a good one. Well, in addition to that 15.3 update, 
I saw lots of stories, and you linked to some of them this past week, where people were talking about the next 15.4 update. Now, it's mm -hmm. not available yet. These are just some people that are uh, hoping that we're going to see some of the additional uh, components and things that we've been waiting for for quite a while. You got a great story here in 9 to 5 Mac where everything new in the first betas of iOS 15.4. Some people were downloading that beta, tweeting out pictures. And I think Frederico uh, from Mac Stories was uh, doing several things and showing people like what these look like. This is this is great. So 15.3, get that download, uh, uh, you know, download that and update your devices. But just briefly, what are you excited about coming for 15.4, Jeff? There's a lot. And, um, you know, this one could be weeks away because it's just the first public beta, yes. the first beta. Right, right, so, right. you know, it, right. it could be a month before we see this. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's a, you know, one that's, I think, great is I uh, love that since I have an Apple Watch, I can um, unlock my iPhone even if I'm wearing a mask. So if I'm out in yes. public and I don't unlock it for something, my Apple Watch authenticates me. But if you don't have an Apple Watch, then the only way to unlock your phone is to type in all your numbers and letters and everything else, which is a pain. And so it looks like Apple has this feature and you're showing it on the screen. It's a cute little icon that I've come up with, but you can use face ID yeah. with a mask. And so basically <laughs> instead of, it's only looking at the top half, it's just looking at your eyes. And there's right. even a, a feature when you set it up that you can have it, will, will it allow you to work when you're not wearing glasses, when you are wearing glasses. So clearly, Clearly, oh. Apple has less information to work with, and so I'm sure it's not quite as secure, and there's probably an increased risk that somebody who has eyes similar to yours might be able to unlock. You know, again, still statistically, right. I'm sure that's pretty <laughs> low of threshold. But, you know, you are giving up a little bit of security in favor of convenience, but I think it's great that they give people the choice um, if you want to do that. And so I know that a lot of people, I mean, gosh, I remember when Apple came out with the feature for the Apple Watch to unlock. I thought, gosh, we're so far into COVID, you know, and it's taken them so long to come out with this, you know, aren't we going to be done wearing masks soon? But, you know, unfortunately, right. here we are in 20, you know, here in New Orleans, where I live, right. we're under the city's under a mask mandate right now for any, oh any time. So we have to wear them around my office and stuff. So um, as we, we may have masks for a while, and it's nice that you can you now unlock your iPhone. Or at least we'll, right. we'll be able to when I presume that this will be in 15.4. This looks like a good feature. Sometimes keep in mind that sometimes Apple will put a feature in a beta and then they want more time to, to, to work on it. Right. And so right. it doesn't come in 15.4, it comes in 15.5. But this one is enough of a, a, a tent pole that my guess is that they won't release 15.4 until this one's ready. And the initial tests I've seen is that it actually seems to be working pretty well. I've seen people say on Twitter with the beta that it works as advertised. And Apple gets information from a lot of these folks, like, you know, the quote, guinea pigs, as it were, mm -hmm. they download these betas and they provide information or Apple collects some of the information from all these folks. So they learn a lot from that. Yeah. Uh, here's another, <laughs> another feature that I think all of us have been looking forward to since what summer when it was, it was a very beautiful um, and interesting little demo of this. Wasn't it Craig Federighi from Apple was doing mm -hmm. universal control, or maybe it was even before summer, but universal control is where you have an iPad and a Mac together and your mouse can go back and forth. I believe like you can, you can control, uh, uh, different uh, applications on your Mac and your iPad. Uh, interesting to see how that's how that may be coming uh, on that. But that's fifteen point four as well. Yeah, that one's going to be neat. You know, I um, there's a little uh, program that I run on my Mac, and I'm forgetting the name of it. I'll, I'll have to look it up. But where I can actually, you know, run open the program on my Mac, and it allows my keyboard and mouse to be used with a, a another device. So if yes. I'm sitting there at home in front of yes. my Mac, I can open up this program and I can use the same keyboard to control my iPad and go back. Um, but with this new universal control, I think that that program is going to be Sherlock, as they say. I don't think it'll right. be necessary <laughs> because you can have a Mac and your iPad and your iPhone next to each other. And as you just move your cursor from one device to another, your devices start to control that. So I'll have to try it to see how it works. But um, it looks like a pretty cool, pretty cool feature. You know, another one that's supposed to be coming at 15.4 that you had that you just showed on the screen there is the new emoji. Yes. And this one's interesting to me. Always the most important. Exactly. The new emojis. So, so many people <laughs> download and update specifically for the emojis and i, I think apple the knows this and so i think that when apple really wants you to make sure that you're going to update 
your iPhone, they're like, okay, well, let's also put the new emojis, emojis. in this one because we More know emojis. everybody's going to get this update. And there's actually some funny ones in there. I like the one that's got the little hand, like, you know, salute, like, you, yes, sir. I yeah. can definitely see using that one. There's some other cute ones in here too. Uh, it's like a Shrek em- uh, emoji on there and a, and a nest with eggs. Oh, this is so good. <laughs> anyway, it's always the most critical updates that everybody's waiting for. It, apparently 15.4 includes over 30 new emojis. So, okay, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll wait expectantly uh, for that. Yeah. So you mentioned face masks and uh, going into COVID. Something else that you wrote about this past week, Jeff, which was great, was uh, something I should have done. I, I don't know if folks can tell, but I've got a little bit of a ruthless head cold. And I feel like such um, uh, a, a, a crazy uh, non-tech person, but I actually went, <laughs> physically went to a CVS pharmacy yesterday to get a COVID test. And I feel like I should have read your review first <laughs> <laughs> of this on the go uh, test. Jeff, you wrote about this, you, you reviewed this this week, right? On iPhone JD, it's called on go yeah. at home COVID-19 rapid antigen self test. And it looks really cool. Yeah, it's nicely done. It never occurred to me that there would be an intersection between COVID tests and iPhone. But there's actually, I mean, I think this is an interesting story, (laughs) not only for what you can get today, but because of what it may mean for the future. You know, for the today part, you know, I'm sure most of us have, have uh, almost everybody has happened to, had to do a rapid antigen test at some point, and you can buy these tests in your pharmacies if they're in stock. I mean, I, I had yeah, it impossible to you find, can find them, them around the holidays. Um, and, and actually, that was sort of my PSA of this announcement was to go ahead and buy this now. You can order it from Amazon. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. It takes a few weeks. Like I ordered some around um, just after Christmas, and it took about two or three weeks to come. And I ordered another set two weeks ago, and I just got an, an, uh, an alert this morning that it's in Houston. So it's almost to New Orleans. And so it may take about two plus weeks for it to show up at your house. So order it now just so that you have it when you need it. So you have and one, and right. as I explained, you can get reimbursed good... from medical insurance. So it's basically free. But the nice thing about this antigen test is every one of them is a little different. Um, and you're always like, you know, looking at the directions. Am I doing this right? Because you don't want to mess up. And um, but this one, because of the iPhone app, it walks you through step by step with nice, clear pictures and says, you know, this is what you do next. This is what you do next. Now you're going to put this crazy thing in your nose for 20 seconds. Here is a 20 second countdown timer, you know, and it goes through step by step. So when you're following along with the iPhone, you know, you're doing everything correctly in the right order. And it makes it really, really easy to do. And then at the very end, when it's time to actually do the test, it gives you a 10 minute timer. So I, so I love it. You know, this, this was the first part that I thought was really interesting that you can make a COVID test better by integrating it with an iPhone app. And that's what the on-go test does, which is great. And then like shortly after I published this post, then I saw that Joanna Stern at the wall street journal published. Right. She unfortunately did have COVID recently, but she, it worked out uh, good for her because she was in the process of testing some of the, the next generation of test where, you know, people say the gold standard is the PCR test, but the PCR right. test uses, um, you know, molecular testing, but you can now get at home molecular testing and it's expensive. I mean, it's, it's hundreds of dollars as opposed to tens of dollars for the antigen test, but it does detect COVID between, you know, I think she said like between six hours and, and 48 hours earlier. So there will be a time where you may actually have COVID and a molecular test would show that you have it but the antigen test would not yet show you have it. Um, so if, if you really want the best results and you decide to spend the extra money, um, even if you don't decide to spend the money on it, I think it's worth watching this video because she says such a great job of describing the difference between the tests and how they work. And, and these, these home molecular tests also use an iPhone app too. It's, it's an integral part of them. So it's really interesting. Um, but, the, but the most interesting thing for me perhaps is not what you can do today either very cheaply with the antigen test or more expensively with the molecular test. But what's most interesting is that we seem to be moving towards this new world of using your iPhone because it is such a sophisticated computer and yet one that people just have in their pockets to work with some external right. hardware of some sort to, to, to run tests on yourself so that, you know, if you may have today, it's this, but what if it's, you know, maybe the flu in the future or other things you could run a test at home, 
see whether you have something before you need to go into the outside world and expose other people and try to find an appointment with your doctor and everything else. And so I feel like we're now getting a sneak peek. And one of the doctors that she interviewed, who you're actually showing on the screen right now, he says that although the the tests are new, he's like, this is not new technology. This is the Mm. same stuff that hospitals have been doing for a long time. But what's different is it's now compact. It's in a tiny little package that you can buy at home and hook up with your iPhone. But the actual technology itself is, is, is what's been in hospitals for a while. So I feel like we're on the brink of a, of a new wave of medical technology of things you can do at home using your iPhone. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. I think it's great. So it's, it's exciting. I share your excitement. Uh, uh, obviously, I, I will tell you, first of all, my my COVID test came back negative. So if anybody uh, was, was caring <laughs> about that, but I would tell you that. So we went to CVS pharmacy. And we didn't go inside CVS, but they had, they the have like a little right? box. Well, it, no, it, this oh, wasn't even the drive through. They have a little, uh, it, it almost looks like a little shipping, like a storage container outside <laughs> of the CVS. We had to park in a special parking spot. Uh, and, and kudos to CVS for doing this, but, it, but I'm getting to my point in just a moment. But they had a little box out there. There were two doors on this box. One was obviously for the nurse. It said, patients do not come in here. The other door was for me to open. And I opened it. And honestly, Jeff, all that we did, there was a a, a huge plexiglass window between the the nurse and myself, but she just handed me the swab. I did the swabbing (laughs) up inside my nose and I put it back into the tube that she was holding. And she turned around and she put that tube inside this, some kind of a machine that was doing the testing. And she said, we'll text you the results. And it probably wasn't even maybe 30 minutes or 45 minutes later. In other words, what I'm getting to is I, and I'm hearing you talk about this and listening to, to uh, jo- Joanna Stern's uh, uh, commentary here, that she that, that nurse just pretty much did the exact same thing that we would be doing here, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. I know there's some fluctuation with that it was a professional nurse, obviously, that I worked with. And, you know, there's some comfort, I guess, in, in knowing that as opposed to relying on me, a non-medical professional, to, to, to conduct the test myself. But- As your point, Jeff, that with the iPhone, like it just becomes so easy because I love all of your images here that you did as you were going through this test with this on go uh, at home test, like the iPhone is literally walking you through all the steps. I mean, it Mm -hmm. just is that checklist as as it were, and it even has a countdown timer, the nurse had to count for me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when I was taking this, but there's a countdown timer on this on this app, and it tells you exactly how to go through the entire steps. And I, that just hearing you talk about that now, I, I'm even getting more excited about it because this is such a, a, a fantastic way that I, I, you know this can apply not just to COVID tests, but so many other things. I know there's a lot of uh, fo- folks that are suffering from diabetes, for example, that are using iPhone apps for this. You know, and some other some other medical conditions that the iPhone and other phones as well can be so helpful. It's just that the iPhone is so is, is fairly predominant. And so the sense that it can work on that and work so easily, I think is, uh, is unique in that as well. In fact, one of the thing I'll mention that was in the Wall Street Journal video, and you just reminded me of like, there was an actual nurse that could see you through the plexiglass. Um, I didn't mention this in my post, but there are some of these apps that if you want to finish up the test with something that's sort of certified that you don't have COVID, obviously yeah. if you're doing it yourself, how does somebody necessarily believe that you did the test correctly? But some of these apps, the on-go one is not one of them. They offer, a, at least I don't think so. They offer a feature where you can actually pay extra and have somebody on like a FaceTime on your iPhone uh, that a medical professional watches you with the test and walks you through getting the results. Ah. And so therefore at the end, they will actually send you a certificate that supposedly you might be able to use at like a business establishment or maybe even an airport or something. And so it, it's, it's, it's really almost like you actually had gone to the hospital or in your case, had gone to the pharmacy, but you stay within your home. So um, it's it's neat. It's needed. This, we're at the beginning of this. We're going to see even more coming in the future. We'll move from COVID to happy birthday to the iPad. Can you <laughs> believe it's this been a dozen years? Wow. <laughs> incredible. I, it, you know, we, you and I talk about this when it's like, you know, uh, the anniversary of uh, losing Steve Jobs. We've talked about Tim Cook being a CEO. We've talked about the iPhone uh, when it was first announced. And now in January 27th of 2010, and your post here that I'm showing came a day after that, 2010, the iPad was announced. In fact, that's what my background is, by the way. This was a slide that Steve Jobs showed on 27, January 27th, 2010, because he was talking about the fact that everybody already had an iPhone. Everybody already had a computer, and they had a big question mark between those two devices because the question that Steve Jobs introduced that day was, Apple 
we at Apple want to know, is there room in the middle for yet a third category of devices? And I've shown this slide so often because um, the number one question I get from so many lawyers and other professionals that I work with, Jeff, is can the iPad replace my laptop? <laughs> now, in 2010, that was not true. Uh, in fact, I remember that day in 2010, Steve Jobs famously said, you don't need anything else to use the iPad except for your finger, right? You don't need a stylus, you don't need a keyboard, you don't need a mouse, you just need your finger. And I remember he was sitting on the stage in a leather chair and showing how you had the internet in your hands and it was so easy to use. But that has changed, right? Apple now sells a keyboard. Apple now supports a Bluetooth mice. Apple now sells the Apple Pencil. So I guess originally they said, you don't need anything. But now if you want those other things, we can offer all of those as well. Uh, and so that to me has been probably uh, the, the most profound change in watching this device over all these years. I still believe that there is such um, a, a, a huge use for the iPad. Uh, everybody keeps, you know, like I feel, I feel like once a year, we have this sort of the slump from a lot of the tech news people. Oh, the iPad, you know, has peaked, it's going down now. But then Apple comes out with the next year's, uh, the next quarter's earnings. And sure enough, they've sold another 13 million iPads or more or a little bit less, but many times a little bit more. And it just continues to be something that they support. So happy birthday to the iPad 12 years ago. And I love going back to your post on January 28th, 2010, <laughs> and reading about this and what you were saying back then. Little did we know at the time. It's interesting because at the time yeah. that I wrote this post in 2010, I really thought of the iPad as just a larger iPhone. And in some ways it is, but then there are Everybody so many did. categories of things that you do in the iPad that you would never use an iPhone for. And then again, as you pointed out, some people are like, well, is the iPad just a replacement for the computer? In some ways it is, but it also does things that you would never really do or never do as easily on a computer. Right. It really is its own category. When in, in that first paragraph of this post from 2010, I wondered, you know, wow, this could be a wonderful way to sit back and read and highlight cases. Well, yeah, I do that pretty much Boom. every day of my life as a litigator, Boom. Um, but so much more too. So um, I, I, you know, the iPad is so useful. I love being able to use it in my practice for the last, you know, 12 years. Um, it's amazing that it's been a dozen years since it came out. But um, again, I, I love the iPad so much. It's such a critical part of, of my work life. And I, and I love using it at home too. It's great. Uh, another article that you linked to here, which was great from, I think it's Ed, Ed Hardy uh, mm -hmm. from Cult of Mac. Let, mm -hmm. me, um, let me turn off my, um, uh, allow my ad block to go here so that we can get back to the site here. 12 reasons to love the iPad on its 12th birthday. These are great. And as I went through these, I just thought they were great. In fact, I think our tips this, this, uh, this week talks about this iPad at 12. Number one, iPad gives a real alternative to traditional notebooks. Mm -hmm. So we'll, 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 we'll save that for just, just a moment. There are iPad models for everyone. I mean, now we have the regular iPad, we have the iPad air, we have the iPad pro. It's just amazing that, uh, we, we have, all of these options today. And I still see even kids, not only just my, my kids, but so many other kids that I hear about that are using an iPad still to this day, even from an educational perspective. Uh, In fact, just to pause well. on what you just pointed out, the iPad yeah. is not just the iPad because the iPad pro that I use, which is huge, you know, right. it, it, it's because it's so big that it works so well for me for briefs and iPad mini on the other hand, it is the opposite. I mean, it would, it would not serve my needs, but it serves a whole nother market as this easy yes. to hold almost like a paperback. So even within the iPad, there are some very, there are very unique, you know, products within the line. Um, it's, 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 I'm, I just can't be more. Absolutely. Impressed. In fact, I was just thinking yesterday, my daughter uh, went on her uh, here in Ohio that they have to drive for so many hours with a, with a professional uh, trainer. And sure enough, as she got in the car, she was telling me that the, the, the gentleman was like taking her information and, you know, writing it down and she had to sign the form. And what was he using to do all of that? Mm -hmm. An iPad. It's just, it, it just, it just, uh, amazing to me how many times that we see this now and we almost take it for granted. It was, it would almost be like, why are you using paper? Like, I can't, I can't almost stand to go into a doctor's office today <laughs> and write on actual paper. I'm like, how can you still be using something like this? But I, therefore I, I know that there are times when it is important to use the paper, but uh, it's just another, uh, uh, another place where I just remember my daughter telling me about that yesterday. It's like, it, it's, it's becoming sort of ubiquitous in that sense. Like we almost an anticipate that, which, which nothing, is 
Yeah, nothing to do with the iPad, but my son has finished the training with the driver. Yes. And he's now got his learner's permit. And so I've been driving with him. And I will tell you, don't he doesn't listen to this podcast. So between you and me, he's actually a pretty <laughs> good driver. But I still okay. can't help but being nervous because when I see him driving, all I can picture is when he was like two years old and playing uh-huh. and stuff like that. And now I'm sitting at him and he's sitting next to me behind the wheel. And I'm like, oh, no, oh, no. So <laughs> I can't help but getting nervous. So, Just so don't let him use driver. the iPad while he's, while he's driving. Right, one, at a time, one at a time. <laughs> okay. Something else you linked to today, Jeff, which I didn't even know you neither, could do. Neither did this I. This is crazy. This is crazy. Okay, so let me set it up quickly this way. There were several stories this past week of um, uh, apparently some, I think it was a woman that uh, apparently was a little deranged in some sense and was was uh, stalking Tim Cook. Uh, the lawyers were able to get some kind of a restraining order against this, this woman. And uh, apparently one of the results of this was that, again, in your post, you say, I don't even know Tim Cook's home address. <laughs> but apparently in this story from uh, from Killian Bell on, on Cult of Mac, if you did know Tim Cook's address and you put it into, I guess, either uh, Apple Maps or Google Maps, the house, uh, Mr. Cook's house, would be blurred out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and at first I'm pretty like, amazing. oh, it must be nice to be Tim Cook that you can have your house blurred out. Exactly. But, you know- Exactly. Because exactly. anyone could do this too. It's uh, I had no idea you could do this. I had this. no idea. And you know, I don't really want to do it for my own house because I like the fact that if someone is coming to visit me, which right. happened as much during COVID, but in the future, you know, it's useful if you're going to someone's house for the first time, you look it up and you know what the house looks like. And so when someone's, when I'm driving to that person's house, I'm like, okay, it's, it's, it's the one next to the red one with this. Right. And so I right. want I don't want to to blur my house, but if you had real privacy concerns, and certainly if you had you know you know stalking issues or something right. like that, so I can a scenario, absolutely right? understand scenarios in which you want the privacy of not having your house so easy to see on Apple Maps and Google Maps. And um, little did I know that you just follow a few steps and um, you know just wait a little bit and it gets done. So uh, it's really I feel like this know. is another public service announcement. Thank you. Uh, Many Colton PSAs Matt, today. Yes, that is fantastic. And and he does like just like you said, Jeff. He outlines it beautifully. You can go to the Apple Maps, apparently you just need to send an email to uh, a specific address here at apple.com and ask for the address to be censored. And then in Google Maps, there's a few more steps you got to follow on here, but you can go to click on my home and under the request blurring options <laughs> into your email address and click submit. And it may take a while for it to happen. He even, Killian even mentions that here. It's not clear how long it takes, but that's amazing. Thank you for linking to that. I had no idea. And again, just like you, I'm not as concerned about it because I do like to have folks, you know, be able to recognize like what color the house is, that kind of a thing. But I absolutely understand that there are some circumstances where folks may want to uh, take advantage of this. And mm-hmm. I'm just glad that it is an option. And now if, uh, if anyone that's listening to this and myself, if, if you ever see this in the future, you'll know what's going on. Exactly. I, otherwise, so, I would have been like, what's that? So if blurring your house wasn't crazy enough, <laughs> we are now going to talk about drinking virtual beer. <laughs> now, Jeff, uh, just like I mentioned, I've been talking, giving presentations on the iPhone and the iPad for many, many years. And I remember even all the way back in 2008, 2009, 2010, when I first started talking to folks about the iPhone, there was one app that I saved for the very end of the presentation because it was it was like the showstopper, right? It was the thing that just got everybody to be like, oh, I got to have one of those iPhones. And the app was called iBeer. And apparently I had no idea that the original developer, I thought he just did it on a whim. It was almost like a beer bet, if you will. But apparently this gentleman, and good for him, made millions and millions of dollars on this app because he benefited from me. I bought it. I forget it was like $1.99 or 99 cents. But what this was, <laughs> was it, it was an app that took advantage of the accelerometer on the iPhone, right? So literally you could watch the screen of the iPhone fill up with beer and the suds. And then if you turned it as if using the iPhone to drink from the corner of the iPhone, this, the beer would flow out of the corner of that iPhone as if you were drinking beer from your iPhone. I I hope that makes sense. If you're just listening to this, Uh, you have to go and check out these stories because it is amazing. And the thing is, I even, I still have the app on my iPhone, but it's, it's not been updated in in years. So it won't even open right now, but I just leave it on there because that, and I think the lightsaber app, (laughs) 
were the two apps that I, I remember I would show people all the time because the accelerometer on the lightsaber app would make the lightsaber sounds as I swung the iPhone around, you know, holding it very tightly, of course. But the iBeer and the lightsaber app, I'm just so glad this is a great story. The inside story of iBeer, the underdog beer app that made millions. Yeah. At the time, nobody really knew what an accelerometer was, the thing that could tell us. So <laughs> right. it was a great demo to sort of show off the feature, uh, which was neat. Um, now, the article is fascinating because he was talking about, you know, there were times that he was making tens of, you know, tens of thousands of dollars every single day. And there's hey, actually sort right. of a negative near the end of the article. He says that it, he had so much money coming in at some point that he, he started, you know, it, 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 it's not always necessarily a good story when you have so much money so right. quickly. And so, right. you know, he had right. to come back from all of that. But, um, but still, it is very interesting. And the other thing that I thought was interesting about this, this is it made me go back and I found that, I don't know if you have it up there, but I linked to a post that I had written in 2009 where I had the most top selling apps and the top free apps on the, um, on the app right. store. And again, this was, a long, this was the year before 2010 when the iPad came out, this was back in 2009. And it's funny to see all of those um, apps because most of the apps on this ah, list don't is. exist anymore. Um, a few of them do, like the third one in there, Enigma still exists, but most of these don't even exist anymore. But it's an interesting look wow. into what the App Store was just a year after it had come out. You know, and it's a lot of the same things that we have today games, some utilities, <laughs> some of the things that are in here. Um, in fact, one of the, the jewel free apps was like a flashlight app, which of course now is included. Um, right. And there were you Tetris know, other, is on but here. It, yeah, it's fascinating to look. And, you know, in every one of these apps that you're looking at, they all made, you know, over a million dollars, um, if not more. Crazy. So um, it's, it's this... very interesting. Your post is from 2009. So the mm -hmm. iPad came out in 2007. I can't remember exactly the, when the, the app, app store, store was in, in the middle of 2008. So the app store yes, had been okay, around okay. for not quite a full year when I wrote this post. And these are the, so number two on here was Koi Pond. <laughs> Mm -hmm. interact with fish on a pond of water. I remember that because I think um, that was still around even when the iPad came out and there were people with, you know, uh, showing their cats trying to catch the fish swimming yeah. around on the, on the it's iPad. It's not, it, that, that app, most of these apps not, are not available yeah. anymore. Flick yeah. fishing, Texas mm -hmm. Hold'em, mm -hmm. uh, field runners, uh, I fart mobile. So, you know, that's, <laughs> maybe it's good that some of these are not around. <laughs> Which I see in the, that I called in, in this the, old post, a productivity app. I fart a mobile. Product <laughs> <laughs> I had forgotten I made that joke. <laughs> that is great. That is so, great. Uh, okay. Interesting trip so that, that, lane. that should be it for the news today. Let's go back to what we had sort of alluded to. We're talking about the iPad. It, I guess maybe in honor of the iPad being 12 years old this past week. Uh, now, uh, a couple of iPad tips uh, and mine. I'll go ahead and start off with with this one here. Something that came out, I think, only about a year ago, and it's called Scribble on the iPad. Now, the reason I wanted to just to remind everybody about the Scribble app, or the, it's not even really an app, it's sort of now built into the uh, iPad OS. And this is really mo mostly for the iPad. Uh, you can't really, you, you can see your scribbles on the iPhone, but you can't do it on the iPhone, at least nowhere near as uh, seamlessly. Now, so the reason that I think is important, at least for me to remember this, is when I'm taking notes on the iPad, I'm either typing my notes into something like the Notes app or OneNote or something like that, or I am only handwriting notes with the intention that the handwriting is going to stay in its handwriting, if that makes sense. Now, some of the apps I think you're going to talk about today will allow you to search your handwriting. But the, the point that I'm making is I'm never usually handwriting uh, my notes with the intention of converting the handwriting into text, if that makes sense. Even though I know a lot of people will ask that, and a lot of people have asked that. Uh, initially, the iPad, I don't think, was powerful enough to be able to handle that, but today it can. And um, it is something that is supported natively on the iPad. This came out last year with iOS 14. So Scribble, and the best way I can show, let me, I might get into another uh, story here just to show, is that you can actually get into scribble mode. The best way to do this is you can go and try this out first. And, th and the way to do that is go into your settings. And I think you go into um, uh, the, 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 let me see if I, if I had it on here. Oh, settings and then Apple pencil. And when you go into that, you'll see a scribble section and this will give you a little pop-up that you can like try this out because it's not just about handwriting a letter and then immediately having it converted into an editable text or a character, but you can also do some other things like delete some text by just scratching it out as if you were scratching it with a pen on a paper. You can also add some space in between some text. Uh, and another thing that, that um, 
uh, you can do is select some editable text. I, I realized that without me doing this in real time so that you can see what it looks like, it's a little confusing. But the best way to do this, once you go into the settings in the Apple Pencil uh, settings section to try it out, the best way to see this in action is then to open the Notes app on your iPad. And once you do that, you can pull up this little tiny, uh, well, it's not really that tiny. It's a small toolbar at the bottom. I, I call it the scribble toolbar. It may be called something a little bit different, but it has the different pens and the highlighters and the erasers and all kinds of you know, ways to change the color of your pen. So that's a little toolbar that shows at the bottom. And the first one is, it looks like a pen, but it has a letter A on it. Now that's the scribble pen apparently. And if you tap on that, as you start writing like A, B, C in your handwriting, the scribble functions will immediately convert that into editable text in the notes app. It's pretty amazing to watch it happen in real time. You got to be fairly reasonable in, in writing well <laughs> so that the iPad can recognize it. But then once you sort of get the hang of it, it can really be a powerful way to quickly write in uh, your own handwriting and have it immediately converted into text. The notes app is probably the best way to see this happen, but you can also do this scribble in like a search box of some kind. Unfortunately, the only stopper that I know is that it doesn't work. The scribble functions don't work in all of the various apps that I would use. Like I like using notability for handwriting a lot of my, my notes, but the scribble function doesn't seem to work the same there. Although, as I said, notability will allow me to search my handwriting. So anyway, I just wanted people to be aware of the scribble functions in the iPad. And this has been around for about a year now. Two things I wanted to say on scribble. One, the time that I find it most useful is when my Apple Pencil is already in my hand because I'm like right. you know, taking some handwritten notes, for example, and then I switch to another app and I want to like, let's maybe search for something in my email. The pencil right. is right there in my hand. And when it goes to the box oh. where I would type the word I'm searching for, I just use the scribble feature because the pencil is already in my hand right. and I will just right. you know write Brett, B-R-E-T-T, -T, and right. then right. It, it will enter that text in return. So I, I probably wouldn't reach out for my pencil to enter text. I would just use the keyboard. But in those times when the pencil is already in my hand, it's just a lot more seamless and it yeah, works with all the sense. Apple apps. So that's what I use it for the most. And then the second thing I wanted to point out is I had actually forgotten, and I'm glad you mentioned it, that in the settings app on the iPad, if you go down to Apple Pencil and then right underneath the word Scribble, it says try Scribble. Um, it's, it's a, right, it's a right. cool little feature that you can try all the different things you can do with Scribble in terms of selecting text, deleting yes. text. It really is sort of an interactive um, primer on how the feature works. So even if you use Scribble sometimes like I do, um, when we're done with the podcast, I'm going to go back and, and run through this real quick just to remind myself of all the different things. <laughs> Scribble. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. I had forgotten that that was there. Excellent. Um, Your the, tip, sir. So um, your uh, reference to Scribble and the fact that it's the 12 year anniversary of the iPad made me of course thinking about how I use my iPad with my Apple Pencil. And one of the tips that I wanted to share, and it's something that I wrote about an iPhone JD, you have it shown on the screen here back in 2019 and, and things have actually changed 2019. In, in the almost three years since then. Um, when I am annotating a document, what app do you use to do that? And usually I will use my PDF app of choice, which um, used to be Goodreader years ago right now. Uh -huh. It's an app called PDF Expert. Um, but then you can also annotate a PDF document using a drawing app. And the one that I prefer to use is GoodNotes, but there's other ones out there too, like I annotate, stuff like that. And my the point of my tip today is I hope that you have both of these apps on your iPad. Whatever yeah. you use for PDFs, for me, it's PDF Expert. Whatever you use for handwritten notes, for me, it's good notes. Um, but keep in mind that there's both of them have the ability to annotate PDF documents. Normally when I open up GoodNotes, I'm creating a notebook and it's got something that looks like a legal pad. I'm taking handwritten notes, but you can just as easily take a PDF file like a, like a, let's just say as a lawyer, like a brief that my opponent wrote or, 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 or a draft of a brief that, that an associate wrote for me. And I can open up that PDF document in GoodNotes and I can annotate on it. And it includes many of the same tools um, but then again, there's differences too. And so my tip today is to remember that an app like GoodNotes might actually be the best tool for the edits that you're going to make. Um, or maybe it's not. Maybe you actually want to use your PDF program. And I'll give you some examples of why one is better than the other. First of all, if you have a PDF document that is not 
already OCR'd. You know, maybe you haven't done the OCR process yet, or maybe it's the type of document that's like an exhibit that doesn't even make sense to really do an OCR on. I actually prefer using GoodNotes to highlight because GoodNotes has a feature that when you highlight in yellow, it then takes whatever the text was below it and it makes it dark again. As opposed to PDF experts and many other um, PDF apps, if you have something that's not OCR'd already, that, that you don't know what the text is, if you highlight over it, all it's really doing is adding a yellow layer on top of the text, which makes the underlying text harder to read. Yeah, it's right. almost like it's one coat of paint on top of another coat of paint. Right. It, it makes the, the underlying coat <laughs> harder to read. And so right. um, that's an example where GoodNotes, I think, actually does a better job. Um, also, I find that in GoodNotes, if you have a bunch of annotations and you want to like move them to a different part of the document, um, like maybe you were just jotting something in the margin and you don't have enough space, so you want to move it for somewhere else. GoodNotes yes. has a nice lasso feature to circle yes. all of them and move them. Whereas in PDF Expert and many other PDF type apps, each annotation is like a separate object and you sort of have to tech to select them and move them. It can be a little bit harder. Now, if you want to move just a single annotation on the flip side, I actually think it's easier to do in PDF expert, but that's just uh, something to think about the differences between them. Um, what if you want to do just a drawing? What if in the margins you want to write something? Um, which app is better for me depends upon mm. what I'm doing. If I'm yeah. just sort of sketching something out, um, and again, I'm not like an engineer or an architect or anything like that, but sometimes I'll just want to draw something. Um, if it's going to be something that I'm just sort of drawing freehand and that's what I want the end product to be, I find that GoodNotes is better with its drawing tools because it really yeah. excels at just, you know, handwriting stuff. On the other hand, if I want to put more of my architect or engineer hat on, if I want to draw like a polygon that it actually has all the lines are perfectly straight and it's like a multi-point polygon. PDF Expert is actually better because it has some new drawing tools that were added recently. And to, this is one of yeah. the more advanced tools that you have to pay a subscription for. But like right. if I draw something right. that would be like a stop sign with multiple different points, and then I could actually put my pencil on any one of the corners and drag that corner out. And, and I, I can literally manipulate the object. So it's a lot more sophisticated. It also has call out tools and stuff like that. So if the annotations that you're going to be doing are more akin to what you might see on like an architect's blueprint print or an engineer's blueprint, for those types of things, I think that PDF expert is better. But if what you're looking for is more like what a cartoonist might do, just drawing things on the corner, um, drawing a tiny little picture, I think PDF expert is better. And there's other examples too that in when you open up a PDF file in Good uh, Notes, when you get to the last page of the document, if you swipe again to the right, it's going to create a new page, which new is page. a second version right. of the last right. page of the document, which is almost right. never what you want. Whereas you're not going to have to deal with that nonsense with with the uh, of the PDF expert or something like that. So there, there's another thing I should mention is toolbars. PDF expert lets yeah. you add your own toolbars if you if you pay for the subscription. And so you know this is my toolbar for this type of task. These are the specific tools that I want. Good Notes doesn't give you that. So. Um, I'm not recommending that you use one versus the other, just the opposite. My tip of the day is to be <laughs> conscious of the fact that if you always yeah. use one type of program for annotating PDF documents, keep in mind that another type of program, specifically like your writing program on your iPad, for some times may actually be the better tool for the task. So just be cognizant of it. I think I'm mostly in the same camp with you. If I'm doing something that is PDF focused, as in like I need to edit the PDF or fill out a PDF form, PDF expert is the app that I go to. But if I'm going to a meeting somewhere where typically, uh, it, it, well, in the, in the past, if it was a physical meeting, then, you know, there would be like, oh, here, I made copies for the table and everybody take a piece of the paper, you know, for the meeting agenda or whatever it is. But today, of course, I always say, well, wait a minute, you created this agenda on a computer. Can you just send me the PDF of this uh, of, of this agenda, because I don't want to take notes on a piece of paper anymore. So what I would do if they send me that PDF, Jeff, what I'll do is I will import that into my app of choice is typically Notability, which is very mm -hmm. similar to Good Notes on there. But anyway, just that's that's the way that I sort of would underscore that if I know that I'm taking notes. And in many cases, it's so much easier for that last little thing you just said. If I'm taking notes, sometimes that single page maybe isn't enough and I need some additional space to make some notes in Notability or in Good Notes. It's just so much easier to create that new page. And then I can just keep, continue to scribble on. And then what I still love about that is it is now in digital form. 
So I don't, I don't have to worry about losing that piece of paper with all my notes on it. Plus, it is now searchable. Both Notability and Good Notes allow you to search your handwriting. So I know that if I ever need to go back to those notes, that they are PDFs. I can have it uploaded to Dropbox or somewhere, and I can find those notes and I can search them. And to me, that is so way more powerful than having a piece of paper or a legal pad or something like that. So I'm so glad you you put that uh, in. Yeah, one thing you said there, and I'm sure you do this too, but like if I'm in a meeting and somebody hands me the agenda for the meeting, and if I don't have it yes. in digital format already, yes. what I will do within Good Notes with you. is I will just take, you know, the Good Notes app, and I'm sure Notability can do this too. You can actually uh-huh. take a picture of those two pages and just add them to your notebook, create a new notebook yes. with just those pages, and then you have it in digital form maybe not right. as pristine as it would have been if they had sent it to you as a PDF file. And then you can annotate on the side of it. Um, and I do that all the time too. So. The last thing quickly, I would just say, this is just a, a, a hint of how you use good notes. And I know this because you were uh, generous to be on my apps and law podcast back in January, 2020. So it's now two years ago, but it's still the, the, the topic is still very, very relevant. You go into all kinds of detail about how you use good notes and the structure of your different notebooks and that kind of a thing. So I just, I'll, I'll put this link in the show notes for anybody, you know, if you listen to this podcast, this would be another episode that would be very good to listen to, to get a lot more involved about how Jeff uses good notes and all of the, the details on that. Whew, okay, I, that was a lot. So thank you for staying with us. And Jeff, thank you for all the links today. There was quite a number of bullet points, but hey, t- it, it is what it is. It's a new year and a lot more information, but uh, thanks for joining me and we'll talk to you next week. It was great talking to you today, Brett. Bye-bye, everybody.